Well, it is, it is a, a gift to be here with you guys today. I'm going to just start off by saying I am absolutely exhausted. Um, and I think last week I felt kind of scattered, but this week I don't feel so much scattered, but I do feel tired. Um, that, might mean, that might mean we're out of here early today. We will see. But what it does mean is this, is that, you know, I had been working on uh, a sermon in, in Romans chapter 8, which is without question, I think, my favorite chapter of Scripture in the entire Bible. Um, and it's had probably some of the most profound impact on my own life. And uh, not only do I want to do that justice and do it when I've had a little rest, but it just seemed timely to share with you guys um, a little bit about Roberto Miranda as it relates to us. So I, if you were at the service on Friday, you've heard some of what I'm going to share today, but I want to expand on it a little bit because uh, I don't think it's too much of an exaggeration. Paul, you can chime in on this if you want, but I, I'm not sure we would be here if it weren't for Roberto Miranda. I'm not sure we would be in this room today if it had not been for him. And the way that his story intersects with our story is that Paul and uh, Dave McGill and Mark, I forget Mark's last name, Mark Gear, and I think there was Ralph Keys, but there was someone else here. Um, Jim Benson was an interim pastor. And anyway, the, these guys were looking for a way to help this church because we'd fallen on hard times. And that's, the, that's the very short version of the story. Um, but they got introduced to Roberto, and they were just going to see if there was a way that Line of Judah, which, you know, has been a very prominent church in Boston and has, uh, you know, kind of seen as a church with lots of resources and energy and, and you know, the work of God on, on the hand of that ministry there, just to see if there was some help they had. And, and Roberto scheduled a meeting, which was actually next door um, in, in what is now a, 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 a teacher's lounge for our daycare. Uh, but we had a little meeting, and, and at the time, our family, we were living just about four minutes from here in Hyde Park, and Roberto called me, and he said, Stephen, um, I've got a meeting in your area at a church. Would you come? Would you come and join me? And I'm like, what's it for? He's like, oh, no, just come. Just come. And a lot of you heard this story, and I told Sonia, hey, Roberto asked me to go to a meeting, and here's the thing. When Roberto asks you to come to a meeting, you go to the meeting, right? That's what you do. Uh, we had been doing ministry at Line of Judah. I had been there five years. Were we there? Ten years, maybe? Ten, ten, eleven years. And we've been doing ministry there, serving there. I was an associate pastor at the end of our time there. And uh, so he said, come to a meeting. I went to the meeting. And Sonia said, Stephen, watch out. I said, what are you talking about? She said, watch out. Um, do not commit to anything when you go to this meeting. I'm like, I don't even know what this meeting is. Like, there's nothing to commit to. She's like, no, no, no. Roberto has something going on. And um, sure enough, he was playing matchmaker. Uh, and, and I know that, you know, we even went to Line of Judah one night and met with Roberto and Greg and Paul, you were there and I was there. And he was just kind of like massaging this, this little uh, uh, adventure of us coming here and, and just helping this community to, to stay here, and not only to stay here, but to thrive here. And um, I was with Greg yesterday. He, he came over. The Greg Bishop was the associate pastor at Line of Judah. He's now pastoring in California, but he was back. And he said, Stephen, he, was, he, he said goodbye to everyone at our house. And he said, Stephen, Stephen, take me on a little tour. Take me on a little tour of the church. And so we, I walked him around, and we came in the front door just to give him the the, the, the experience. And Greg is very, um, Greg is very expressive. And he goes, Stephen, whoa, this is, looks so different. It's so beautiful. And he literally pulls out his camera. He's pastoring this kind of small church in California. He pulls out his camera. He's like, I'm taking pictures so I can show them what it's like. Because, you know, I go to Line of Judah, and I, none of that would work in my, where I'm at. But this would work. You have a prayer line? Oh, I'm going to take it. He takes a picture of the prayer line. I'm like, Greg. And he's like, he takes a video, and he gets, you know, he's got, got me in the video. I'm just like, Greg. But he was like, this is such a different place. And it wasn't, you know, obviously he's not seeing you, but he's just seeing 
what God has done in the last 13 years. And, and it just struck me in that moment, like this wouldn't have happened if it weren't for Roberto. And uh, I'm gonna share some other ways that we're connected and ways that we've been blessed. But another one that was interesting, and I shared this with Greg, is I had him come up here and I said, this stage is the sister of the stage at Line of Judah. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, Roberto, um, he, he, there was a, a what's the, a, a gym. There was a school gym and they were pulling up their floor and Roberto went and got all the wood from the floor. He just figured, he had a connection. He asked for it. They're like, take it. If you can take it away, we'll give it to you. And he took all the wood from this basketball court. And then he called me and he said, Stephen, I know you're wanting to do some renovations in your church. Would you like some wood? I said, yeah. And he said, well, we just built our stage. We've got a ton left. We have things we want to use it for. But come take as much as you want, and then whatever's left, we'll use. And it was just, you know, they had actually put their stage in a, a, probably a couple of years before that. They still had this wooden storage. And so I went, I think, with, with Kevin Bisbee, and uh, I think we borrowed your truck. Huh? And you went, and we just grabbed boards and threw them in the truck and drove them over here. And then we went back and grabbed more boards and threw them in the truck and brought them here. And then went, I think we did like three trips. And, and he said, do you want more? I'm like, no, no, we have all we need. He's like, do you need anything else? I said, yeah, we need some carpet. Because this carpet was like a mess. He said, well, you know, we're doing a project, so I'm, we're putting in carpet. Why don't we, we're, we're buying at such volume that we get it 20% off, so why don't you order through us? So we ordered through him, and the price came out, and then I think he only let us pay half of it. He wouldn't even let us pay for the whole carpet. So like this room, it's a gift from Roberto, from Line of Judah. Um, when we came here, I was working very part-time at Line of Judah. I think I was making like, I, was, I, I had a full-time job and I was essentially like, uh, and, and Line of Judah loves to do this. I was the associate pastor of English ministries at Line of Judah, which meant that I got a $600 stipend every month. And they know, they know how to like, they know how to get like a thousand people on the payroll for two people's salary. Like they're really good at that. But, you know, and I didn't mind it. I was just grateful I got anything because I love being there. And um, when we came here at the time, uh, the church couldn't afford to pay me at first. And um, Line of Judah continued that stipend for us and for you for, for two years, two years they kept paying that money to us just to, because they cared about what was happening here. Um, and even after the church started paying me, they kept that going, they committed to two years. Um, so it wasn't that, you know, I kind of joke like thousand people for two people, so like, that's a little joke, but it's like, it wasn't because they were stingy, it's because they wanted to be generous with so many people. You know, they wanted to honor so many people who served and gave. And that even when we left, they continued to honor us and honor this work here in Dedham and the ministry of the gospel in this corner of Milton Street and Myrtle Street for no other reason than that Paul and a couple of other guys from the church said, hey, would you help? And that's all it took. And that's the kind of guy that Roberto was. And, you know, we could talk about... <laughs> And just they're just flooding. Like I remember one of the very first weeks it rained and there was water dripping down. And I don't remember if that was a new thing or if it had been going on for a while. They're like, oh, the roof's leaking. That's not good. We gotta fix that. So, you know, we went to find out how much the roof was gonna be. And I think it was like twenty five thousand dollars to get the roof fixed. And you know, we didn't have twenty five thousand um, dollars. so Roberto found someone and he did it for half the price. Um, he just came, and, and because it was a church, and because Roberto had asked him, he came and he did it half the price, and we had just enough money to pay him so that the, the roof wouldn't rot and the sanctuary wouldn't have puddles in it. You know, that's, he, he just did that kind of stuff. He found a way, um, and so many times, so many times, he blessed this church, he blessed us, so that we could, so that we could stay here, so that we could serve here. If if it hadn't been for him, we would not have been able to serve here. 
it had been for him, I'm not sure there would be a church in this location right now. Uh, and then, you know, that means there wouldn't be a Christian couple running a daycare next door. There wouldn't be a La Latino church here meeting in the afternoon. There wouldn't be, uh, you know, just a sign outside that says something about how God loves you. Like, that wouldn't be here. Understand? Um, every single one of us, in that sense, we have a debt of gratitude to a man who maybe some of you didn't even meet. But because of his generosity and because of his tenacity and because of his boldness and all sorts of things, you know, we were blessed. And I shared Friday that when I first met Roberto, um, Sonia and I were just dating. And he was kind of a, he was kind of a scary guy. Um, how many of you have actually seen him? Like, can we get that picture back up there? Is that possible? Um, uh, he, he's a larger than my figure. And, you know, Sonia's sister, her name is Meche, and that's Roberto's wife. And um, Meche says, you know, people would always give Roberto clothes. They want to give him gifts. Like, people are always giving him gifts because they receive so much. He's the kind of guy, you can't be with him five minutes without getting something. You know, wisdom, insight, encouragement, financial provision, you know, a resource, something, a connection. So people were always feeling very grateful, and they would... They buy him clothes, and she said, they keep buying him these large shirts, and he's a medium. Like, they think he's so big that they want to get, they get him these large clothes, and he can't wear any of them. And, um, you know, I think when I met him, I was a medium, too. After a while, I could take the clothes that he couldn't fit in because I grew a little bit. But, uh, <laughs> you know, they always thought he was bigger than he really was. And he was like that. He was larger than life. So he was, he was scary. That, you know, Roberto helped pay for that carpet, David. I don't want you spilling coffee on it. Like, what, what are we doing here? Dude, pay some respect to those who've passed on. Uh, he was intimidating. And, uh, you know, I didn't know him that well yet. And, and I did share this. The very first, he, he reached out to me. He said, hey, I'd like to meet with you because I was dating his sister-in-law. He's like, I'd like to meet with you. And... Um, he invited me to come to Line of Judah just to sit down and talk. And, and at some, it was like on a Tuesday afternoon at 2.30 or something. And we were, we were up at Gordon-Conwell at the time and doing our studies. And, and um, I remember he called me, and I missed the call. And I looked down, and it was, it was 2.45. And I was in the woods with Sonia on a walk in Gloucester. And I was like, oh. I just blew off Roberto, <laughs> and I was so scared. And Sonia was like, no, 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 just call him. It'll be fine. And uh, I didn't have any signal out in the woods. I just saw the missed call. So after, it was like another half hour before I called him, and I said, Roberto, I'm so sorry. He's like, Stephen, Stephen, no, 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 don't worry about it. We'll just schedule another meeting. We'll just, we'll just reschedule. No, I had plenty of work to do. Don't worry. No, 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 please, no. I'll take you out to lunch. Don't worry. We're, it's going to be fine. And he was that kind of guy. He always wanted to put you at ease. But when I got there, I was not at ease. I was not at ease. And, and I, remember, I remember being so mad at myself that I couldn't stop shaking sometimes when we were meeting because it was just, I would get nervous. I'm like, Stephen, he's not scary. You don't need to shake. It's not cold in here. What's going on? But he just had that impact. But he was always so kind and generous. Um, and this is what I shared. I said, you know, the thing that I noticed about Roberto first I mean, I'd heard him preach. Um, I'd seen him lead in church services. I'd had, you know, short one-on-one -on -one interactions with him. But I just remember in that first conversation, we were talking about ministry and life and theology probably. And I'm in seminary studying theology and scriptures and all. And he would just say things. And it wasn't like he was quoting the Bible. I mean, he did at times, but it wasn't that. It was just like the things he said were so clearly informed by a scripture and biblical worldview. The things he would talk about. And he would make allusions to these Old Testament figures that probably, I'm just guessing, probably a lot of you have never heard of half these guys. And he would just intimately be alert to the details of their life. And, and I was like, 
it's like I'm walking with someone who lived in Bible times. It's like I'm having a conversation with Elijah, uh, who was, you know, interestingly referenced as a, as a figure that Roberto was like. Uh, it was like I was, you know, uh, sitting in a room with someone who had seen fire come down from heaven and knew that God was available just like that if he was ever needed. And I remember thinking, I know all of these stories. I've read all of this stuff. I've read, you know, at that point in my life, I'd read the whole Bible more than once. I had studied it, taken classes on it, but I had no sense of having the confidence of a person that had seen fire fall down from heaven. But that man saw fire fall down from heaven, and he knew what God was all about. I just thought, that's crazy that someone today could have that kind of, not just knowledge of the scripture, but to be, it was like he's swimming in the ocean of God's word. Like he was just immersed in it. And he breathed it in, he drank it up, and that's what came out of him. And, you know, I even remember when I noticed that for the first time, uh, just kind of feeling like, I, I want that. I want that kind of relationship with him. And it really annoyed me that he had never been to seminary. <laughs> you know, he didn't get this through some, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? You know, established and, and authorized source. He just got it just by living with Jesus. And it reminds me of this passage in the book of Acts where um, Peter and John are arrested by the, the Sanhedrin and, um, and they spoke boldly about Jesus. And it says in Acts, uh, it says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus because these were not educated. I mean, Roberto was educated, but just in a different field. But like these Peter and John, they weren't, you know, they hadn't been to seminary. They hadn't done any of those things, but they had walked with Jesus. And that's where their boldness and their knowledge and their wisdom and their insight and their courage, that's where it came from. And I just remember thinking, I want that kind of relationship with Jesus. And over the years, I saw this play out. I saw time and time again, I would ask him, you know, how did you deal with this thing that happened at church? And he'd say, well, you know, I was... I, I did this, and I did this, and I did this, and none of it worked. And then I was praying, and then, the, you know, and then that's the rest of the story. Or how did you deal with that? Well, we tried this, and that didn't work, and we hit this roadblock. So I was praying. You know, I was with the Lord the other morning, and he gave me this, and it worked. And, um, <clears throat> you know, it's, it, how many times have we heard? I just pulled up 2 Timothy 3.16, which says that um, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for training, rebuking, correcting, and training, uh, for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And I thought, there was a man who was thoroughly equipped for every good work because he lived in these things. He lived in this book. And he lived in it in more than one language, <laughs> you know? And um, it was amazing. He could quote scripture in Spanish. He could quote the same scripture in English. Um, but never to impress, right? Always to encourage. And so I shared on Friday, like, the things that came out of that that I saw that were important. And by the way, the, there was a, a pastor. And what's the name of Sergio's church? Do you remember? Uh, Harvest Church. Uh, Sergio Perez was, was preaching. And I got to tell you, if, if you need a pick-me-up, if you need encouragement, if you need to be invited again to follow the Lord with all you've got, go listen to that sermon from Friday night. It was powerful. And um, it, was the, it was the perfect sermon for the moment. Um, and there's plenty of things that he shared that I'm not going to share because that's his, that's his to share. But what I want to share is these three things that I saw in Roberto that, to me, really exemplified what it means to be a person who lives 
from the scripture and not just from the scripture, but by the spirit, because again, you could, you could read these words. I mean, I know, I know a lot of people who study these, these words their whole life and they are not people of God. They are not people who have intimacy with Christ. They're not people who walk by the spirit. Um, so it's not, it's not just from studying it. It's from living it, right? And letting it lead you to the person that wrote it, right? To the Holy Spirit, to the Father, and to the Son, Jesus Christ. That's the point of it. He understood that these words were an avenue to the Lord. They were not an end, right? They were, they were a pathway. So this is what I saw in him. The first thing that I saw in Roberto uh, that, that really uh, sticks out to me uh, was that he was one of the most driven people I have ever met. And I know a lot of type A people. I, I work, uh, some of you guys know, I uh, have spent many years in financial planning. I work for this guy, super type A guy. Every time I call him, I say, how are you? He says, oh, I'm super busy. And I think he wears it almost like a badge of honor, you know, that he's always busy. And he is always busy. Um, and he is always going, 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 going. But with Roberto, it was different because this guy, he's always busy because it was like, it was like he's always busy because he has built this apparatus around him that pushes him forward at all times because it's almost like he has built a business and he's not running the business, the business is running him. That's just how I see it. But Roberto, I got the sense that it wasn't that he had built an apparatus that was driving him. It was that he truly believed that the life worth living was the life that was expended for the Lord. And, you know, we're in 1 Timothy. So in 1 Timothy 4, Paul is talking to Timothy and he's telling him uh, basically that that he thinks the end is near for him. In 1 Timothy 4, he says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. So this is, this is kind of Paul's last chance to, based on his own life with Christ, to tell Timothy, this is how you should live. And he says, Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. For... I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the race. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only me, but all who have longed for his appearing. I believe that Roberto's life was modeled on these words. Preach the word, correct rebuke and courage with patience, hold firm to the doctrine, to the truth, right? I endure all hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge your duties of your ministry. He did all of those to his utmost. And you know, Roberto was the kind of guy that you could be with him and he could just see right through you. He could see what was going on. He could read you. Uh, I think Greg shared that it was a little disconcerting how well Roberto could read you sometimes. I also do remember when I first met him going to church and thinking, is he going to know things about me that I don't want him to know? Like, this is uncomfortable because he knew things about you that you didn't necessarily want him to know. <laughs> I was like, am I next? Am I the next victim of this? That dissipated over time. I think, you know, he was also, uh, again, gracious. But, but there were also times when we would be with him, and it was just like his body was there. 
but he was totally sapped. And he wasn't, he wasn't engaging. He wasn't seeing you well. And, you know, as I shared with, with Line of Judah, you know, I, I don't say that as a complaint. I mean, yeah, I would have loved to, in those moments, for him to be more present or more able. But, but what I saw was a person who had given everything he had for the Lord that day and to the Lord's people that day. And he came home blasted, and all he had left was to simply be there. And he tried, you know. But there was a sense in which I, you know, it, there's this fine line because we, there's a part of me, and I think in our culture today, there's a part of us that wants to say, no, he should have reserved himself to be present always for his family. But here's the thing. He was often present for his family, often. He was, the stories you hear from his kids, he was very present for his family. But there were also those times when because he was serving the Lord, he gave everything he had and left nothing on the table. And when we talk about how God has called us to use what he's given us for his mission and his glory in our identity statement, Roberto was like that. If he had something, he used it for God's mission and God's glory. If he had energy, he used it for God's mission and glory. If he had money, he used it for God's mission and glory. If he had time, he used it for God's mission and glory. And there were times when Sonia and I would say, he's, he's going to run himself to death, right? And we thought, he needs to slow down. And, you know, it's a tricky thing. Because maybe he should have slowed down. But at the same time, there's something about a person who's willing to pour themselves out like a drink offering. Meaning that you, you, you expend yourself fully and there's nothing left. I mentioned this Friday, but the, in, the, in the altar in the temple, um, there's, there's a fire going, right? And you bring, you know, you bring the sacrificial lamb or the goat or the, the dove or whatever. And I don't know if you guys notice this, but when you put an offering on the altar, it, they, the smell goes up to God. That's God's, and the fat gets cooked in that. Oh, you know, like when you're cooking bacon, that smell, you know how beautiful it is? That goes up to Jesus and he smells it in and he's like, that's a good offering, right? But the priest you don't burn it up. The priest takes the meat, and that's his dinner. He eats it. There's something left over after the offering is made. But when you pour out the drink offering, it just, it's gone, right? And that's what Paul's talking about. And he doesn't say, I'm being poured out like a drink offering, and I wish I had slowed down in life. He's saying, I'm being poured out like a drink offering, and now I'm going to receive a crown. A crown of righteousness, which the Lord will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but all who have longed for his appearing. Everyone who's willing to expend themselves for the Lord. Everyone, when it says longing for the appearing, the appearing, it doesn't just mean like, oh, I hope Jesus will come back soon, right? It's not just that. It's people who are willing to devote their lives to the ministry of Jesus Christ until he returns. They will receive the crown too. And I do believe that Roberto has a big fat crown, right? And I want to make this very clear. He doesn't have a big, big fat crown because you can say, oh, he had a big church. And oh, he did all these things. And oh, he was well known. And I mean, guys, there were like 2,000 people at his funeral. The mayor of Boston came. You know, like, he was known. We were joking, like, we're, we're related to this celebrity. It felt like a politician's funeral or something. But that's not why he got the crown. He got the crown because he discharged the duties of his ministry, and he expended himself for the gospel. See, it's not about, in this case, it's not about 
so much the fruit of his work, but it's the fruit of his heart for the Lord to live a life like that. And I didn't say this at Line of Judah because I didn't want to offend anyone. But Roberto would have been driven no matter what he would have done. I said that. What I didn't say is we joked that if he were not a pastor, he would probably be a dictator of some country in, in the Caribbean or Latin America somewhere. You know, like one of those presidents that wears a military uniform, that kind of president. Like he, he meant business. Whatever he was going to do, he was going to do it to the extreme. But he didn't do that. And I tell you, the guy had a mind for business like few I've seen. And they mentioned this uh, the other night, but the, the building that Line of Judah built where their new sanctuary is, is about a 10 to $11 million building that he, had, that he was able to have built for $4.5 million. So <laughs> because he would find these incredible deals because he would be able to negotiate these outrageous contracts. And he also had these things where like, he had all these little schemes going on all the time. And there was one I remember where he had a guy who worked in an import business. And he said, but when the, when the box, the crates came, they would unload the crates and then they put them back on the boat and take them back wherever they came from. So they were empty. So he had figured out, he had negotiated with this guy to take supplies to these, this Christian ministry in whatever country, it was like South America or something, for free, because they, the, they had to take the crates back anyway. I'm like, dude, you know, you could like put products on that and sell them. You know, this is the kind of mind he had. He was always figuring these things out. But he didn't do that. He could have, he could have been great at whatever he did. But he chose to be great for the Lord. He chose to give himself the Lord. And I have to admit, and we've talked about this before here, but there is a bit of grief and regret and shame to think about how many hours I have spent watching television or reading the news on my phone, playing a game, or you know, whatever it is. Things that bear no fruit. Because I thought, oh, I was too tired. And I think he had a different level of stamina than most people. I don't know if you've heard it. There's some people that really only need five hours of sleep at night. He was one of them. He's like, no, I find if I get five hours, that's... So he would wake up at four in the morning and like write books. Be out late, be up early, work, work, work. And he had that stamina. I don't think I could do that. But I know, I know that I, that I often... Uh, instead of living like this, like Paul did, like Roberto did, I often live in a way that allows me to be a little more comfortable. You know, And that's a challenge for me, but I think it's a challenge for all of us, that we can live lives. We don't have to be like Roberto, but with what we have, we can live lives where we use it for the glory of God, and we use it for the ministry, the mission of God, because that's, that's what he's called us to. Out of that, because of Roberto's living a life out of this, he was also an incredible risk taker. Um, he would take on things that shouldn't be taken on because he knew that no matter what, even if he failed at it catastrophically, that the Lord would have his back. And that he didn't have to worry too much about failing. He didn't have to worry too much about being proven wrong. Because if he did, then he knew that God would work even that out for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. You know, um, there's this verse in Matthew 11. And it's kind of funny because I've looked at this verse so many times. Um, it's, got a, it's, it's hard to translate. And in most of our Bibles, um, it says this. This is Matthew 11:12. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence, and violent people have been raiding it. Okay? The kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence, and violent people have been raiding it. And in context, that makes a lot of sense. He's talking about John the Baptist, 
uh, you know, the guy who had his head cut off, right, for preaching the gospel. Uh, and, and you think, well, yeah, of course, the, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence, and violent men have raided it. The problem is the translation is a little weird because it could also be translated that from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been advancing forcefully, and forceful people lay hold of it. And I can't tell you whether Roberto's exegesis on this is right, but I can tell you he lived by the, from the idea that it's forceful people who lay hold of the kingdom of heaven. Meaning, not so much this negative bad thing, but this positive reality that if you are bold, if you take risks, then the kingdom of God will be at hand for you. And again, oh goodness, I wish I could just say, that's exactly what the Greek says. It's a tough one, but I don't care anymore because I've seen in his life that it's true that forceful people lay hold of the kingdom of God. I've seen in his life and others that people who take risks and trust the Lord for audacious things are often given more than they even thought they could achieve or more than they thought they could attain. That building, not only was it a $10 million or $11 million building that was built for less than $5 million, is they started the project in 2008. You guys remember what happened in 2008? Massive financial crisis. Professional uh, 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 consultants for building projects in Boston told them, you won't get financing. There's no way you're going to be able to pull this off. Don't do this now. Just wait. And Roberto said, by God's grace, I am going to get financing, and we are going to pull this off. And it is going to work. And man, they made it work. They got the money. They got the resources. They got the materials. Because there was a recession, they got all the materials cheaper than they would have if they'd waited, right? Because prices on construction materials had fallen uh, like into the, a ravine because no one was building, right? And he got labor cheaper than he would have gotten it. And then, and then he had things uh, like... They didn't want it. They wanted to drill instead of using a pile driver because it made so much noise and they weren't going to let them uh, drill. But then the neighbors were complaining about the pile driver. So the city put everything on hold and he got through all the red tape, just not, not because he had some special, you know, ability or connection, but just, he just prayed and God just worked through the red tape and made it happen. And they were able to get the drilling done. And they, you know, get those pylons into the ground. And they built that building and they thought, oh, what if we add this? Well, you can't add that. Well, let's add it anyway. You can't add it. They go to the city. Sure, you can add it. Like, and I don't know if, you know, maybe none of you have ever been involved in any kind of construction project in Boston. But it, Boston is like one of the worst places in the country to try to get a building built. Yeah. Right, that's how hard it is. So, you know, you've got this situation where everyone's telling him it can't be done, but now you walk into that place and you know what? It's done. Like, it's there. And I remember just this week, just thinking about our own process, and, and I was kind of thinking about Roberto, Sonia. You said to me, this is impo it's impossible to get through this. And I knew exactly where you were coming from. But I just thinking of Roberto's life and example, I said, you know, it's impossible until, until you've done it. Everything's impossible until you do it. And then it's not impossible anymore. And he lived that way. And there's so many things. Um, they, they have ministries at Land of Judah that should not exist. They shouldn't be funded. You know, I remember they, they get these government grants and everything in those grants does not allow them to be used for religious organizations. And they keep getting the grants because they just push ahead and they, and they do such great work and they have such excellent uh, quality and they do things to the best of their ability. And in line of Judah, I'm telling you, the people there have caught that and they expend themselves for the gospel. They do things with excellence. And then there's nothing the government can do to stop them from getting this money because they know, like for example, uh, they have a higher education resource center where Sonia used to work. And there, 
so successful in helping minority inner city kids get to college on scholarships. It's like, how could you not give them the money? It doesn't matter if they're religious. They've got, they, they, have, they have a ministry to help kids um, approach their burgeoning sexuality with a focus on abstinence, which is like a total no-no, but it was working. So they got money. You know, it's over and over things like that. And the daycare, Mariposa that's here, I was talking to Jose Paulino, who's the, who's the owner of that daycare. And he said it was Roberto who told him, you need to start a business. And he's like, oh, I can't do that. He's like, no, you can do it. And, and he encouraged him and challenged him and pushed him. And now they've got the successful, now multi-location daycare. And not only do they have, that's like another example. They pay us every month money, right? That we wouldn't have if there was no Mariposa daycare. So it's another example of, of Roberto having influence that then blesses this church, you know, blesses that family. And Jose and I have become much, we've gone much closer over the last few, have they been here eight, nine years now? Eight, 10 years, it's crazy. Um, and I know that Rob and Saranj were instrumental also in saying, we had a conversation, I think out in this parking lot, and I said, oh, I kind of wish we had a daycare here. And they said, oh, well, we know someone who's trying to open a daycare. And it was, it was the Paulinos. But Roberto had pushed them to open that thing. So it's just like all these ways that he challenged people. Our, I don't even know what she is, our cousin, Aneri, who just graduated with her law degree because Roberto challenged her to keep pushing ahead in her education. And she cared so much about the immigration legal challenges for immigrants. He said, go, you know, go get your degree and like become an attorney and help them. So she did. And her graduation was, he was on his way to the party. He didn't make it to the party, but he, he got to see the day that she graduated. You know, and it was, we were, I was talking to her sat Friday and I said, how many people in this church do you think have degrees because of Roberto that they wouldn't have had without? And she's like, probably 100 people, maybe more. Because he always challenged people, take a risk, push on ahead, do your best, do, trust the Lord. He'll make the finances work. He'll make the, the admission work. He'll, you know, he'll work it out. And people, it's almost like you, when you, I don't want to say this the wrong way because I don't want, Roberto is not a, he's not a, um, an angel or anything. He's not Jesus, right? But it was like there were times when you didn't have enough faith, but he had so much that you could just kind of latch onto his and believe enough because he believed. And then it would just work. It would happen. And I think the people of God miss out on so many blessings because we actually don't believe God's going to give us the thing that either he told us he was going to give us or the thing that the longing he's put in our heart that you can tell is that this is like a heavenly longing. This is a godly longing. But we're so afraid. And God's like, just trust. But it was so helpful to have someone there who could say, I trust the Lord. And here's why all these things he's done for me. And he'll do the same for you because I'm not special. And he would say that I'm not special. The Lord is the one who's special. And so if you're with the Lord, he's going to do these things for you too. And I've seen over and over people's lives radically change because they just rode the coattails of Roberto's faith. That's not the right way to say it, but I think you know what I'm getting at, right? Because Roberto took so many risks, though, there were things that did fail. And because he pushed him so, himself so hard, there were times when he did fail. There were times when he fell short. There were times when he didn't do things the way he ought to have done. Because he is human, right? He's not Jesus. But that just brings the final thing that, that I admire so much about him is that he never let failure or pain or grief or hardship he never let those experiences pass by without taking the lesson from them right 
So he even knew, I mentioned earlier, uh, if he failed, then God would use that for his good too because God uses all things. God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. And that's in Romans 8, 28, but just a few verses before that. Paul says, uh, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For creation was subjected to frustration, not only by its own, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, and hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We'll get in this in a couple of weeks, but he's saying, look, when Adam sinned, sin entered the whole world, and even creation was put under frustration. Not because creation had done anything wrong. Creation was good. But because God chose to subject it so that in creation there would be a sign not only of the fall of man, but also the redemption that would come through Jesus Christ and that it would be freed from decay, brought into the glory of the children of God. And we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we await eagerly our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Paul saying this. He says, look, life is hard. Life has suffering. Life has failure. Life has pain. But here's the deal. The glory is coming. The glory that will be revealed in us is so much greater than the suffering we currently experience. But what that does, if we have eyes to see, is it pushes us to long more and more for the glory. It pushes us to long more and more for the redemption. It pushes us more and more to hope in the return of Jesus Christ and the work of his spirit in the here and now. And we know well, in the same way the spirit helps in our weakness. We don't know what we ought to pray for. When you are experiencing hardship, what do you pray? Lord, get me out of this, right? Lord, take away this thorn in the flesh, right? But we don't know what to pray for. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. So creation groans, we groan, the Holy Spirit groans on our behalf. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in the accordance with the will of God. And the will of God is not always to get us out of the pain. The will of God is sometimes to keep us in the pain until the pain has done its work. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his Son. What is the will of God? Not that you be free of pain, but that you come out of this process looking like Jesus. And one thing I can say is that as Roberto went through his process of life, he looked more and more and more and more like Jesus. I've known the man 18 years, which is not as long as some of you in this room. I've known him 18 years, and I, he is a different man from the man I met. Part of the reason I was scared of him 18 years ago is that he was a scarier person. He was a harder person. He was, not as, he was not as gracious a person. And this is not to put him down. Look, he was still amazing. But through his own hardship, his own failure, his own pain, he became more gracious. He became more tender. He became more emotionally connected. He became more loving. Right? He became more silly. He had, he had a sense of self-importance. He had a sense of like how he wanted to present himself. I was sharing this story last night. We used to have this little salt shaker, and it shaped like a dog, and it had a collar, and there was a little bell on the collar. And the first time he was over, and he used the shaker, it went ching, 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 ching. And he said, oh, Sonia, do you have another salt shaker? Because he wanted to use a salt shaker that didn't make a bell noise when he shook it, because that just wasn't right for him. You know? I think now... If he had that salt shaker, 
he would say, oh, I want a salt shaker like this salt shaker. You know, he would be, at, I mean, he always added a lot of salt, but he'd add even more salt if he had a salt shaker like that. He would laugh about it. You know, he's a different, he became a different person because, and I used this phrase last, last Friday, I said, he's the greatest failure I think that I've ever met. Meaning he did more with his failures. He grew more through his failures. He learned more from his failures than almost anyone that I've ever met and seen up close. And he is a, a model for me of how to be softened by the hardships of life, how to be renewed and conformed into the image of Jesus through the groaning. And Roberto experienced a lot of groaning, not just his own. He, he, he held the pain of thousands of people. He carried the burden of thousands of people. He heard so many sob stories, so many difficult situations. And he didn't just let them bounce off him like water off a duck's back. And I think there, there's a sense in which sometimes we, uh, you know, I'm strong, that stuff bounces off me. And he would say, no, I'm strong, that stuff comes into me and goes through me. You know, you understand? And it did its work. It did its work. I was listening to a podcast from Peter Scazzaro, who wrote this book called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And he said, people who are not restored and redeemed by pain are not safe people. They're dangerous people. And I was listening to that Friday morning. And I thought, and that's where I came up with this thing, Roberto is safe. He was safe because he suffered. But not everyone who suffers is safe. It's only the people who let the suffering do its work. The ones who suffer and don't let it do its work, they become bitter and they become more dangerous than they were before they suffered. But the ones who let it enter into their system and be used by the Holy Spirit to shave off the sharp edges of our hearts and our souls and our thinking, our minds, those people are safe. And Roberto ended this life as a very safe person. It's not just familiarity that made me not be afraid of him. That's part of it. Um, he, just, he just doesn't en engage you the way he used to. He's gentle. Soft caring, in ways that he just wasn't before. Always a good person, right? But it was just different. And the people closest to him, we experienced it the most. This new kind of Roberto. I want, I want to get to the end of my life with that work having been done in me. You know, Friday, I think four or five of us who shared, we all planned to end on essentially the same thing. One, uh, Sergio Perez said, there was a mantle on Roberto, and he was talking about uh, Elijah and Elisha, and the story of Elijah and Elisha, Elisha Elijah's the prophet, Elisha is his follower, and when Elijah is taken up to heaven in a chariot of fire, his, his, um, like his cloth falls on the ground, and Elijah, Elisha picks it up, and it says that he is given, um, he's given the mantle of Elijah, and that he receives a double portion of the blessing that was on Elijah. Elijah, and and it's really interesting in Elijah's story. You see all these miracles that he does. Elisha does all the same miracles, and he does twice as many. He receives this double portion, and. Um, and he said, who can wear the mantle of Roberto? And I think we all agreed that none of us could, but collectively we could. So who will carry forth a life like his? Um, Greg Bishop, who shared, said, uh, um, I think he used the word anointing, if I'm not mistaken, that Roberto had an anointing on him, and now who will, who will carry on that anointing? As I was sharing, and I got this from Sonia, she's, 
you know, we were talking about, and she said, he's left this big hole. Who's going to fill the hole? Who's going to step in? And it's going to have to be so many of us to step in. And that sometimes when someone passes, they leave this space. And it's kind of like, we don't have to do that because Roberto's doing it. Well, he's not doing it anymore, so now we need to step up. And I know a lot of you didn't know him, so that doesn't feel as, as uh, um, urgent, maybe. But Roberto was a presence in the city of Boston that needs to be filled, and it's not going to be filled by one person. But we can all fill it. We can all begin to be more that kind of presence in this city, in this region where we are. We all can immerse ourselves in the scripture and, and live like the Bible characters lived. We all can expend ourselves for the work of the gospel and for the ministry of Christ, for the kingdom of God. We all can take more risks. We can, we can be afraid, but we can trust the Lord and be courageous to do things that we shouldn't be able to do because God loves to show up where we're not able to show up. Um, 2 Corinthians 9, I will boast in my weaknesses because your strength is made perfect in my weakness. It's not about you being great. It's about you showing up with your weaknesses so that God can show up with his power. You know, all of us can let the challenges of life shape us and reform us into the image of Jesus Christ and make us the kind of people that God, that God is pleased to use, those who are humble, those who are gracious, those who are kind. And so we all can step in to that hole. We all can carry on that legacy. We all can put on the mantle that has been left in the wake of this great man's passing. Um, I'll just end with this. I watched a lot of people over 18 years put Roberto up on a pedestal. And I hate that. I hate that. No man or woman deserves to be on a pedestal, and no man or woman has earned the curse of being put on a pedestal, because it is not a gift to that person. And so when I say the passing of a great man, I want you to understand that is not because I thought he's especially, you know, that he's a, some kind of like special superhero. It's because I saw him the day to day the ins and outs of his life, consistently and faithfully follow Jesus, be with Jesus, and live for Jesus in ways that I've seen few people do. That's why he's a great man. That's why there's a big fat crown that he has received. That's why when they, on Friday, they put up the verse about being a good and faithful servant. And, uh, you know, tears started to roll down my face. And I just, I just started clapping. And then the whole room started clapping because we knew he was indeed a good and faithful servant. And um, we all can be that. That crown that is awaiting all who long for his coming. It's not just for men like Roberto. All of us can live out of that calling.